Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer and welcome to Threshold of Hope, our program where we bring you the writings of Pope John Paul the Great, Blessed John Paul the Great now. And I would just want to mention that today is a series of feast days for different people. Uh, the main calendar of the church is St. Eusebius of Vercelli, who was born around 283 and died in 371, of the ripe old age. He was a bishop of the city of Vercelli in Italy and was sent into exile by the Roman emperor, who was a Christian, but was an Arian heretic. And St. Eusebius defended the faith of the Council of Nicaea against the Arians. And so he was sent into exile in the Eastern Empire and suffered quite a bit. As a matter of fact, he's even considered a martyr because of all of his sufferings. But he was allowed to come back after doing great work of helping to spread the Catholic faith. Today is also a feast for Jesuits, uh, the Feast of Blessed Peter Faber, who was born in 1506, to, died in 1546, only 40 years old. Uh, Peter Faber was uh, a poor shepherd who, whose family couldn't afford an education, but he would cry himself to sleep every day you know, that he, because he wanted to get an education. And eventually his parents allowed him to go to school at the local parish, and uh, the, the pastor taught him. Then he went to high school and then to the University of Paris where his roommate was Francis Xavier. And then the next roommate they got was Ignatius Loyola. And Ignatius called him to be a Jesuit, uh, and he was the first priest ordained for the society. Uh, and then Francis Xavier also joined them, and they founded the Society of Jesus. But the third feast day is Our Lady of the Angels. This was the small chapel that the Franciscans built in, uh, at the bottom of the hill from Assisi. And this chapel is uh, very important for the Franciscans. And one of the things that uh, I think all three feasts bring out is that at various times there are needs for reform in the church. That we have the, the Arian heretics were trying to take over in the time of St. Eusebius. Uh, the um, church had grown lukewarm in the time of St. Francis of Assisi. And in the time of St. Blessed Peter Faber, uh, he was dealing with the Protestant Reformation and people leaving the church in large numbers. And in all three cases, it was not accommodation to the culture that made the difference, but it was the holiness of saints that made a difference and converted many people back to the faith. Now we want to take a look at some of your emails. Remember, you can send us emails by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. So the first email, Dear Father Mitch, we have one family member who went the way of the Society of St. Pius X years ago, the SSPX. She is always passing on newspapers which deride our Holy Father. My question is, what is the key thought to pass on to her to show her that Pope Pius X was all about obedience to our Holy Father and that those who question and try to tear down the words and writings of Pope Benedict XVI for our blessed John, Pope John Paul II are not in communion with the Holy Catholic Church. Bonnie, you know, one of the things that, uh, I, I don't know how this would help, but sometimes people have a sense of their own arrogance and that they are very prideful. I know what the Catholic Church teaches better than the Pope does. And they literally are trying to be more Catholic than the Pope. And so they attack the papacy and so on. Uh, and, and the good that John Paul II and Benedict XVI have been doing. And I don't know that you can really fix that except by praying and fasting for them to come to a kind of humility which accepts the authority of the papacy. Because really, they put themselves in the same category as those people who call themselves liberals and are disobedient to the Pope. 
you can be disobedient whether you're on the left or whether you're on the right. Either one is wrong. And I put them both in the same category. So pray for their humility. Father Mitch, our church held a Pax Christi ecumenical event last year, 10 nuclear war in honor of Hiroshima. I attended because I do not believe war is the answer. Well, that's, that's good. There were people from all religions, Protestant, Buddhist, Quakers, Muslims, Jews, etc. They each shared a prayer for peace, and that was fine with me until the Buddhists placed their prayer box on our sacred altar where the Lord is and started chanting to Buddha for 30 minutes. I was offended because our oral altar is sacred, and this is not the God I believe in. Namely, Buddha is not the God I believe in. Our pastor and the Catholic representative of Pax Christi did not stop it. This year I elected not to go, and I said a prayer for peace at home. How should I respond to this? Florence in Florida. Well, Florence, my strong recommendation is that you should go to the Pax Christi representative and to the pastor and say, look, I want to pray for peace. I believe in ending war, and praying for peace is what I want to do. But I don't want a mixture of Buddhism with our Catholicism. That's something that's going too far. So if the Buddhist says a prayer like everybody else did, that would be okay. But taking over the whole thing by chanting for 30 minutes, that sounds like most of the whole ceremony that they were chanting. And you know, doing that is something that is contrary. Had the Catholics chanted Gregorian chant for 30 minutes, I'm sure some of the others would have been upset too. So, uh, though they probably would enjoy the beauty. But this is something that I think is very important to talk to your pastor about so that when something ecumenical happens, they do not go over the edge and break the, bon the boundaries of you know, where we begin and our Catholic faith begins and their religion ends. You know, that they, they can say a prayer or something, but you know, this is something that we have to be very alert to because our Catholic Church is not a Buddhist temple. And as much respect as we have for the Buddhists, they also have to have respect for our altar and, and our sacred place. And that's very important, and they should not break those bonds. Okay? All right. The other thing you might want to do is start off, you know, your own prayer service for peace and do it in honor of Our Lady of Fatima. That would be a good thing. A very good thing, in fact. All right, we are going through the document, Radem Taurus Missio, which means Mission of the Redeemer. You can get a free electronic copy at our website, EWTN.com. When you go to the website, go to the television tab, and then click where it says EWTN Live Shows, then click on Threshold of Hope, and you can watch last week's show if you missed it, and download the document that we're going through right there on that page or you can visit EWTN's document library. All right, we are on paragraph 51.1. The title of this is Ecclesial Basic Communities as a Force for Evangelization. He says, a rapidly growing phenomenon in the young churches, one sometimes fostered by the bishops and their conferences as a pastoral priority, is that of ecclesial basic communities, also known by other names, comunidades de base in Spanish, or base communities. These are very common in the third world. And uh, they are proving to be good centers for Christian formation and missionary outreach. Now, these are groups of Christians who at the level of the family or in a similarly restricted setting they, the base communities tend to be very small. And it's small groups of families or of friends or friends and families in, in small settings uh, who come together for prayer. They pray together on a regular basis. They come for scripture reading and studying the Bible. They come for catechesis and they study the catechism. 
They come for discussion on human and ecclesial problems, that there are various problems that occur by human problems. He means the social problems, what's going on in the neighborhood, uh, things happening with the government, things happening in the marketplace, etc. You discuss those things as well as church issues. So there's prayer and discussion. And because the group is small, you can get to know each other well and that a real conversation can go on. You can't do that in the big parish so easily because there's so many people. But in a small base community, you can have more intimate dialogue. And that's one of the things that he's talking about here. These communities are a sign of vitality within the church. They are an instrument of formation and evangelization. People learn more about the faith, and from their base community, they go and evangelize. They get other people to join, and they teach them about the faith. And so that becomes a way to, for being formed and for evangelizing other people. And it's a solid starting point for a new society based on a civilization of love. Because you're a small group, it's easier for the love that you have for one another to be recognizable because you are spending time with each other and taking care of each other's needs. So that kind of small community is a very positive force in, uh, in a group. A lot of, in the United States, a lot of times it's prayer groups that form the same function. These communities decentralize and organize the parish community to which they are always remain united. So they're not trying to separate themselves from the parish, but they become a way to organize the parish. Because again, some parishes are so big. I was in one parish in Lima, Peru, that had 250,000 people and one parish church. Now that's huge. And what they had to do is divide the parish into chapels, you know, around the different parish areas, and the priest would spend Sunday going from one chapel to another, celebrating Mass as often as he could in the different places for these small base communities that got together on Sunday in a neighborhood church. But he couldn't even get so that sometimes the deacons would have a communion service when the priest couldn't get there because there are just so many people and so few priests. The base communities take root in less privileged and rural areas, like the one I was talking about was in a very poor barriada in Lima, Peru. The people were very, very poor. And they become a leaven of Christian life. Remember how leaven works. You no, know, um, uh, leaven is yeast, and a little bit of yeast in a lump of dough helps the whole dough to grow and gives it body. So also, these little base communities help the faith to grow in a larger area and are effective in bringing about the, the faith to other people. They also are there for care of the poor and the neglected. And it's very edifying to see how in these poor neighborhoods, the base communities help people who are poorer than themselves. By any standard, these people are all very, very poor. But they still find ways to help one another, taking some of their rice and their beans and sharing them with somebody who has nothing. So when they have a little something, they share it with those who have nothing. And this is a very powerful thing. I met, I'll never forget one lady, she had a little stand in the marketplace and she said, Father, I made $30 this month. I'm so blessed, I'm going to give half of it to the poor. Now, in the United States, if you made $30 in a month, you would be considered absolutely destitute. But she considered herself rich and that she was going to help the poor. I was very impressed with her. Within them, the, these base communities, the individual Christian experiences community. They get to know that they're loved by some people. 
and that they're part of a community that cares for them and loves them. And therefore, the individual senses that he or she is playing an active role and is encouraged to share in the common task because you're called to account. In a big parish, it's hard to be called to account because there's so many people. But in a small base community, you get a task and people call you to account, but they also help you with your tasks. So there's that individual relationship that's going on. Thus, these communities have become a means of evangelization and of the initial proclamation of the gospel. For many people, uh, in many places, these small base communities support each other in teaching about Jesus to people who don't know the Lord at all. You know, I, one of the times when I was in the Barriada, there was a group who were practicing witchcraft. And the small base community was evangelizing to them to get out of the witchcraft, which they did eventually. But they had all sorts of problems with demonology and all this kind of thing. But the, the base community was the one that got them because the priest didn't even know who they were or where they were. But the little base communities did know. They know their neighbors and they work together and they help get people out of witchcraft. This is also a source of new ministries because you've got a group to support you in the ministry and they can help you get the ministry done. At the same time, by being imbued with the love of Jesus Christ, they also show how divisions, tribalism, and racism can be overcome, especially when the group is composed of people that cross various lines of tribe and race then they can help the rest of society break down these issues. And that's a very important role. Every community, if it is to be a Christian community, must be founded on Jesus Christ and live in him. That's going to be basic. A community is Christian to the extent that it's based on the person of Jesus Christ. And we have to keep him primary. They focus on Jesus as they listen to the word of God. And when, you, when they do their Bible studies, the goal is not just to come up with new theories of this, that, and the other thing, but to hear Jesus Christ speaking to them through the words of Scripture. That's one of the goals of, of doing Bible studies and that they focus their prayer on the Eucharist to wherever that's available so that they come to Mass at least on Sundays, if not during the week. The community lives in a communion marked by oneness of heart and soul and shares according to the needs of the members, just like in Acts of the Apostles, that they shared whatever they had in Acts 2, verse 44. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and distributed them to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved, that that small base community of Acts of the Apostles and those household churches were part of the evangelization of Jerusalem in its day. So also these base communities helped to evangelize their own areas too and bring people to know Christ. Pope Paul VI recalled that every community must live in union with the particular and universal church. Remember, when he talks about the particular church, he means the diocese. So the base community must be in union with the local diocese, as well as with, in union with the whole church. So they're not trying to form a little group that goes off by itself. That would be wrong. There's only the, the Lord Jesus established one church. And this is what we want them to do, is be in union with that church. 
They should be in heartfelt communion with the church's pastors and the magisterium, that is, with the bishops, the priests, and the magisterium, which is the teaching authority of the church. They need to be in communion with that so that they are loving the, the hierarchy all the more, never acting arrogantly and going off doing their own thing. With a commitment to missionary outreach, that they want to go forth and bring the gospel to others. Let they get out of their group. You know, the group doesn't exist just so that you can have a warm, cuddly little bunch of friends. But the community exists for the sake of Jesus and for spreading the gospel. And there's no uh, yielding to isolationism or ideological exploitation. Now, the reason he mentions this is that some of these base communities were basing themselves in liberation theology back in the 70s and 80s, and that they were trying to push a Marxist interpretation of the Bible. And he's criticizing that. This is not about ideology. It's about Jesus Christ. And if you push a Marxist ideology, you're going to push your way right out of the church. And so that's one of the things that he's very critical of. He also cites here uh, Pope Paul VI in his document Evangelii Nunciandi, paragraph 58, where he talks about these base communities, which will be a hope for the universal church to the extent that they seek their nourishment in the word of God. And they do not allow themselves to be ensnared by political polarization, communists versus non-communists versus capitalists and things like that, or fashionable ideologies like liberation theology, which they are ready to exploit their immense human potential and that they remain firmly attached to the local church in which they are inserted and to the universal church thus avoiding the very real danger of becoming isolated within themselves than of believing themselves to be the only authentic church of Christ and hence of condemning the other ecclesial communities. See, that's the danger. You can start to think we're the only real Christians here by our interpretation of things and nobody else understands Christ. And this is something that is very important you know, that they, they, cannot, they cannot allow that to go on. So, um, the Synod of Bishops stated, and this is in the final report in December of 1985, and I quote, because the church is communion, the new basic communities, if they truly live in unity with the church, are a true expression of communion and a means for the construction of a more profound communion. They are thus cause for great hope for the life of the church. So, so long as they don't break off into ideological branches, then they're going to be a sign of great hope in the church. And that's one of the things we want to look for. Now, the next paragraph is paragraph 52. And here, he, the title is Incarnating the Gospel in People's Culture. This is a very important element. As the church carries out missionary activity among the nations, she encounters different cultures and becomes involved in the process of enculturation. This has been true from the beginning. Remember, the first Christians were Jewish. And they went off to the Greek world. St. Paul had been born among the Greek-speaking Jews. So he was a little more familiar with the Greek culture. But the other apostles were not. And they didn't just go to the Greek world. They also went to Iraq, what we call to Iraq today, uh, in, in Mesopotamia, and to India. And so they went to the Roman Empire, in the, in the West, where it was Latin, the Eastern Empire, where it was Greek, the Parthian Empire, where they spoke Aramaic, 
India, where they spoke the lang various languages, and they met these other cultures. And the church has always had to become involved in enculturation, making the gospel understood within each cultural context. The need for such involvement has marked the church's pilgrimage throughout her history. But today it is particularly urgent because there, we know so much more about these new cultures that we're confronting and bringing the gospel to, and we have to understand them better. The process of the church's insertion into people's cultures is a lengthy one. You don't become enculturated overnight. It's a long process. It is not a matter of purely external adaptation. That's one of the things that he wants to make very, very clear. Um, because, as it said in the final report on the Extraordinary Assembly of 1985, enculturation means the intimate transformation of authentic cultural values through their integration in Christianity and the insertion of Christianity in the various human cultures. So there's a twofold thing, twofold thing that you want to take authentic cultural values. Wherever the church goes, these cultures have very important values. There were great goods in the Greek culture. There was philosophy, just as one example, and many others. And there are great goods in the cultures of Africa, Latin America, the jungles, in Asia, and other places. And so we want to really show respect for the authentic values through the integration in Christianity, but also inserting Christianity into these cultures so that it belongs to that culture. The process is thus a profound and all-embracing one, which involves the Christian message and also the church's reflection and practice. But at the same time, enculturation is a difficult process, for it must in no way compromise the distinctiveness and integrity of the Christian faith, so that we want to recognize authentic values but we cannot water down the Christian faith. That's something that we can't do. That's why I had that objection about putting a Brutist prayer box on a Catholic altar. This is not something that's acceptable. That's breaking down the barriers and that we have to have a tremendous respect for the integrity of the faith and its practices, while at the same time, we do try to deal with these other cultures. That's part of our task. And that's something that has to be done with great sensitivity to the teaching of Christ, as well as to the culture in which we're bringing the gospel. We're gonna stop there and take a break. We'll be back in a couple minutes and get some questions from our studio audience, as well as more from this document. So please stay with us. We have a nice group here of folks uh, making pilgrimage to this area. Some of them are on the way to other places, but they stopped by to see us, and we're delighted to have them. And we'd be, we would love to have you come and join us as well. If you can make a pilgrimage down here, uh, please contact our pilgrimage department 
at 205-271-2966, 205-271-2966, or go to our website, www.ewtn.com, and they'll help you with all sorts of information about where you can stay, uh, the scheduling of masses, the, the programs, getting tickets to the shows. The tickets are all free. Uh, we just need to know who's coming. So we put out enough chairs. And uh, getting information of, uh, that you might need to get up to Hansville to see the sisters up at the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament. So if you can join us, please do. All right. Now we have some questions from our studio audience. Let's start off with this gentleman over here. Sir, where are you from? From Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia, just down the road from us. Good to have you here. What's your question? My question uh, is in regards to the small group communities you were talking about earlier, the faith communities. What would be some examples of, of that within the United States? I knew of a pastor uh, down in uh, Calumet City, uh, uh, Illinois, uh, which is just south of Chicago. And he had been a missionary in Latin America, and he brought the base communities up to his parish. And they, they were very active in that parish. He was there for a number of years, and that would be one place that I know of. I don't know of too many other groups, but um, you know, certainly a lot of times um, Marriage Encounter would have base communities. Charismatic prayer groups had base communities. Uh, they, they, in effect, they didn't call them that, but that's what they became. Um, Curcio would have the Altreas, which were a base community of, of sorts. And those would be some other examples that I could think of. Okay? All right. Have another question? Sir, where are you from? Uh, thank you, Father. I'm from uh, Augusta, Georgia. Good to have you. And what's your question? Yes, my father, um, my question, Father, is uh, you touched upon Acts 2 earlier in the show, and that talked about, you know, the disciples sharing stuff and not uh, having property in common. Anyway, a friend of mine from college who's Catholic but a little on the liberal side, uh, he saw that as a justification for communism. Uh, could you comment on that? Um, well, my first comment is that your friend doesn't know much about communism uh, because the difference, uh, did, did you notice in that Acts of the Apostles text that the government was involved? No, no. That there, whereas in communism, the state has control of the means of production and determines the distribution of wealth. You're paid by the state. The, your factory is owned by the state. And so this is state-owned uh, enterprise, whereas they didn't do that. They voluntarily shared, and not all of them had to. If they didn't want to, they didn't have to. It wasn't a requirement to be a Christian, but many people did choose to live that way. So. And, and that's the same thing is true with uh, religious life. We choose to hold our property in common. And that's, that's, that's part of religious life. So, for instance, my wages from EWTN, I don't even see the check. It go right to my province. And, and that's, that's the way it goes. Um, this is something that uh, you know, is, is very, very important so, uh, for religious life. But nobody has to join religious life to be a Catholic. You can be a, a layperson and have all every right under the sun to own private property if you wish. And you don't have to give it up to the state. And that's where your friend is making a mistake. Okay? Thank you. All right. We have another question here. Sir, where are you from? San Antonio, Texas. Good to have you here. And what's going on in the Republic? In the Republic, it's hot. It's hot. I it's know. Hot. It needs some rain. We need some we rain. We need to get the whole country praying for rain for y'all, because I know you need it badly. We'd appreciate that. Yeah. What's uh? My question is, uh, you were touching very much on multicultures and you know trying to evangelize, to bring the word of Jesus to these cultures, and as they continue to immigrate into our country, uh, it it reminds me of how we started with the national churches back when immigration first started mm -hmm. and the, the whether they were the Polish or the Irish, it, it just seems like it didn't work and they broke out into their own little communities. There seems to be a need for that again today. How does that relate to what you're talking about tonight and what's the solution for it? Well, see, you know, I grew up in Chicago and we had national churches. There were, you know, a lot of times I would go with my grandparents to the Polish church. 
Now, why did they have that? We weren't separated. We were a, a, a Polish parish within one of the diocesan parishes. We were a separate church. But why did they go there? They wanted to hear the sermon in Polish. Mass was in Latin back in those days. But we wanted to hear the Mass in Polish. Nowadays, what they do is that a lot of the parishes will have Masses in Polish because you can use the Polish language for the whole Mass. And there are about 50 Masses a, a Sunday in Polish throughout the Chicago area. And that worked very well. The Germans had the sermons in German and so on with the other groups. That was a positive thing so that the people could understand the sermons in their own language. Now, the thing that happens with immigrants is that the immigrants don't speak English very well. Their children speak the old country language and English both. The third generation doesn't know any of the old country language. They only know English. This has been true with one group of uh, immigrants after another. It's going on with the Hispanics right now. So many Hispanics uh, come here from Mexico, they speak Spanish, and their children speak Spanish, but their grandchildren don't. Any number of times I speak better Spanish than their grandkids because they lose it. That's the process of integration into this country, and it's worked fine. Now, there were some nationalist groups that split off. Uh, for instance, there was a Polish national church. Not too many other groups did it, but um, uh, the, 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 there was a Polish national church which had the mass in Polish and had a married clergy uh, way back in the 1920s. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't survive. Uh, they're, they're still around, but there are hardly any of them around. Uh, they, they did not make a big impact because the call is to belong to the whole church. And Polish people are Catholics. And you belong to the Catholic church, not to the separatist group. Uh, so uh, one of my grandmothers did go to the Polish National Church because she wanted to uh, go to there, but uh, to hear the, the whole mass in Polish. But my other grandmother went to the Catholic Church where only the sermon was in Polish. Uh, and, you know, that's just the way that it was. Um, the thing that I hope does not happen is what happened in our family is that you forget how to cook the recipes. <laughs> My niece can't cook any pierogi. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> All right. We are in paragraph 52.3. Through enculturation, the church makes the gospel incarnate in different cultures. So that's one of the things that the church has always done. We've adapted, and some things have been very successful with that adaptation. You know, from the, the evangelization of the Germans came something that's popular everywhere in the world, the Christmas tree. That came from German pagan culture, but it was Christianized, and now the Christmas tree is everywhere. I was in Cairo at Christmas a few years ago, and they had Christmas trees, and they're Muslims. The church, and at the same time, she introduces peoples together with their cultures into her own community. This is one of the things that we also do. We not only learn from their cultures, some very beautiful things, but the church incorporates these other people into her own community of the church. And we see this in Catechesi Tridende, paragraph 53. We can say of catechesis as well as of evangelization in general, that it is called to bring the power of the gospel into the very heart of culture and cultures. For this purpose, catechesis will seek to know these cultures and their essential components. It will learn their most significant expressions. It will respect their particular values and riches. And in this manner, it will be able to offer these cultures the knowledge of the hidden mystery and help them to bring forth from their own living tradition original expressions of Christian life, celebration, and thought. So you see this going on, for instance, in Africa. In Africa, the way that people bring up the gifts, 
you know, is different than we do in America. They'll do it with the beat of drums. We don't do that. That's not part of our culture, but it is part of their culture. And the church has incorporated that into some very beautiful ceremonies. That would be just one example. The church transmits to these peoples her own values at the same time that she gives her values to these peoples, taking the good elements that already exist in them and renewing them from within so that there's so many things that exist in these cultures that you can renew from within and give them a new Christian understanding. So that we see in Pope Paul VI, Evangelii Nunciandi, paragraph 20, that the kingdom which the gospel proclaims is lived by men who are profoundly linked to a culture. And the building up of the kingdom cannot avoid borrowing the elements of human culture or cultures. Though independent of cultures, the gospel and evangelization are not necessarily incompatible with them. Rather, they are capable of permeating them all without becoming subject to any one of them. So this is one of the great things. You know, uh, again, uh, Christmas time is a, a great example of how so many cultural characteristics have been incorporated into the church. In Mexican culture, the days before Christmas, people go door to door singing and, and looking for the baby Jesus, looking for a place to, to go. And then you get cookies and things like that. At Polish Christmas, you put straw under the uh, dining room table to remind you that Jesus was born in a stable. And there are all sorts of little customs that, that happen around the world. And we take what's best in them and, and renew them and give them new, uh, new sense uh, in the light of Christ. Through enculturation, the church, for her part, becomes a more intelligible sign of what she is. We use these different cultural uh, expressions to express what the church really is and a more effective instrument of mission. We share this with other people. I wouldn't go singing Polish Christmas carols if I were in Africa, but I would in a neighborhood in Chicago, you know, where, where it makes more sense. Thanks to this action within the local churches, the universal church herself is enriched with forms of expression and values in the various sectors of Christian life, such as evangelization, worship, theology, and charitable works. So by enculturating, the church becomes enriched. The church is becoming enriched by taking elements from African culture and learning about it, and that the church's life becomes you know, more sensitive by incorporating elements from Asian culture. This is a very important element. The church comes to know and to express better the mystery of Jesus Christ through these different cultural expressions. They each can teach us something very important about Christ all the while being motivated to continual renewal because the church always needs to be renewed and have the faith accepted by each generation all over again. You can't have the faith of your grandparents. You have to have your own faith. During John Paul's pastoral visits to the young churches, I've repeatedly dealt with these themes which are present in the church and subsequent magisterium. Over and over again, you can go to collections. The Daughters of St. Paul have collections of what the Pope said as he made his journeys to Africa, Asia, Oceania, Latin America. And you can see how he kept bringing this theme over and over again to enculturate, to really allow the culture to develop. Now, enculturation is a slow journey which accompanies the whole of missionary life. It involves those working in the church's mission agendas. So missionaries 
have to be part of the enculturation process. The Christian communities, as they develop, have to work on enculturating their own society. They're part of the process. The bishops have to be part of the process because they have the task of providing discernment and encouragement for its implementation. And we see this in the Vatican II document, Agentes, paragraph 22. In harmony with the economy of the Incarnation, the young churches rooted in Christ and built up on the foundation of the apostles take to themselves in a wonderful exchange all the riches of the nations which were given to Christ as an inheritance. All of these cultural things belong to Christ as something that he inherits. They borrow from the customs and traditions of their people, from their wisdom and their learning, from their arts and disciplines, all those things which can contribute to the glory of their Creator or enhance the grace of their Savior or dispose the Christian life the way it should be. All of this is part of what we're learning by the process of enculturation. Paragraph 53. Missionaries who come from other churches and countries must immerse themselves in the cultural milieu of those to whom they are sent. You have become part of that culture and learn. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I did not stay in Peru, there were some parts of the culture I could not adapt to. One, of the, one part of the culture is called drinking chicha. Chicha is a beer that the Indian women make by chewing on corn, spitting it out, and letting it ferment. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And I said, you can't stay here if you can't do it. So I said, I'm afraid I have to go. Thank you. There's only some parts of culture I can deal with. That wasn't one of them. And they had to move beyond their own cultural limitations, which I had trouble doing. I did a lot of things. I ate guinea pigs. I could do, that was one of the delicacies down there. So I could eat a guinea pig, but I couldn't drink chicha. Hence, they must learn the language of the place in which they work, becoming familiar with the most important expressions of the local culture. And this is one of the things I'm very proud of with the Jesuit missionaries who've gone around the world, that they typically write the first grammar books of the new languages they come across. It's very common for Jesuits to, to write this. Uh, in the Jesuit relations, you can still see some of the, uh, the or they, not some of the, but the earliest uh, uh, dictionaries of the Native American languages because they learned those languages in order to preach the gospel in them. They did the same thing with Chinese and other languages wherever we went. And at the most, they, they learn the most important expressions of the local culture, what the customs mean and why they do things, what bowing means and sitting. For instance, when I was in uh, Fiji Island, people think that it's rude to be higher than the most important person in the place. So they sit on the floor with their heads bowed low with Christ on the altar. They have to have their, if they knelt, their head would be at the same height as the altar, and that's rude. So the bishops allow them to sit on the floor so their heads are lower than the altar because they don't want to be, have their heads higher than Jesus, and that's why they do that. They must um, discover the values that through direct experience and, and understand that culture. Only if they have this kind of awareness will they be able to bring to people the knowledge of the hidden mystery in a credible and fruitful way. That's the mystery of our faith. It is not, of course, a matter of missionaries renouncing their own cultural identity. You still have your own culture. And where you come from is where you come from. That's, that's a good, valid culture. You don't doesn't mean that you hate the American or European or African culture you came from, but that you, it just means that you add a love of the new culture to the love of your own culture. But it means understanding, appreciating, 
fostering and evangelizing the culture of the environment in which they are working and thereby equipping themselves to communicate effectively with it, adopting a manner of living which is a sign of the gospel witness and a solidarity with the people. Developing ecclesial communities inspired by the gospel will gradually be able to express their Christian experience in original ways and forms that are consonant with their own cultural traditions. So they need to learn how to express their culture and Christian ways. And so, and sometimes that's difficult. Um, but I mentioned uh, last week how I'd been in uh, Borneo where there were headhunters and they would hang the heads of their enemies from the ceiling. And that was, that was typical of the houses of the, um, of, the, of the pagans. The Christians would hang pictures of the head of Jesus and the and of Blessed Mother, not as skulls, but their, their, their face. And that replaced, you know, the hanging the heads of their dead enemies. And this was, or they put the stations of the cross up instead of uh, human heads. That was a great improvement in my mind. <laughs> and you, you do that provided that the traditions are in harmony with the objective requirements of the faith itself. So for them to continue to hang heads up from the ceiling would be contrary to the faith, wouldn't it? You don't want them to do that, especially when they don't ask permission to get the heads in the first place. <laughs> to the, even if they did ask permission, they couldn't do it. To this end, especially in the more delicate areas of enculturation, particular churches of the same region should work in communion with each other and with the whole church, convinced that only through attention both to the universal church and to the particular church will they be able to translate the, the treasure of faith into a legitimate variety of expressions so that they have to work together with the whole church as well as the individual church, the, the local diocese, and work together on this. And again, we see in Evangelii Nunciani, paragraph 64, that the more an individual church is attached to the universal church by solid bonds of communion, charity, and loyalty, and receptiveness to the magisterium of Peter, and the unity of the lex orandi, which means the law of praying, which is also the lex credendi, the law of believing. That's a famous Latin saying, lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of praying is the law of believing. In a desire for the unity with all the other churches which make up the whole, the more such a church is capable of translating the treasure of faith into the legitimate variety of expressions of the profession of faith, prayer, worship, Christian life and conduct, and the spiritual influence on the people among which it dwells. So that by trying to be unified with the whole church, the local church can do better at dealing with the cultural expression. The more united they are with the church, the more they'll see the Christian aspect of the genius of their own culture. And that's a very important thing. Groups which have been evangelized will thus provide the elements for a translation of the gospel message. Keeping in mind the positive elements acquired down the centuries from Christianity's contact with different cultures and not forgetting the dangers of alterations which have sometimes occurred. These alterations that sometimes occur where people make a bad mixture with the local culture and they incorporate something pagan, and it remains pagan. That would be wrong, and we don't want to have anything to do with that. We simply want to have the sense of the faith being incorporated into what we do so that Jesus can be seen in the culture and as loving the culture, cherishing their values, and bringing those values to a fruition. 
And may we all be involved in this process in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.